And we are live. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Clerk and Clerk and staff and council and viewing public and welcome uh, this morning to our Committee of the Whole meeting of council. Uh, there was a published agenda on our website for those that wish to follow along or for, for the uh, viewing public. Uh, we do have a, it is a published agenda and uh, I do uh, ask for council uh, to approve the agenda as uh, circulated. Would somebody like to move that agenda? No, Deputy Mayor, Councilor Allwood. And that's uh, with regards to one item today with regards to the Great Highlands Lens. Is there any discussion on that? Seeing none, all in favor of that? Okay, that's carried. And just as note, um, we don't have Councilor Allen with us at this time. He may be joining us uh, at, at a particular time. I, I have no information other than that. So we do have an approved agenda for our committee of the whole meeting. Uh, is there any declaration of pecuniary interest with regards to council members today? All right. So the item for consideration is the Gray Highlands Lens uh, practice and apply the lens in an actual situation scenario. Scenario is dark sky policy. And just as a note, this is not a true depiction of an item before council. This is only a scenario being used to facilitate training on the use of the Gray Highlands lens. And uh, Madam Clerk, do we need any, um, since this is an agenda item, it's really, it's, it's for an exercise. We really, do we need to move a motion to move forward with this or just for clarity? No, okay. So it's just a, it's just a practice. It's almost like education. Okay, um, I'm going to maybe uh, pass this over to Councillor Little. Um, if you would like to uh, uh, speak to this or, or uh, maybe kick us off on this exercise, if you wish, go ahead. Right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, I did have a little bit of a, an outline and with council's you know, approval, we can proceed that way. Um, the first thought was to just go over the, the document on how to use the lens, just quick review of that. Um, Secondly, would be to introduce the scenario. Um, it was circulated to you. I don't think there's, you know, there, you could have gone into a lot of research. There certainly is a lot available on the web. Um, no one has time really to do that. We've got enough on our plates, but I think, um, you know, it is something that we can talk about without having had to do a lot of reading. So I'm not sure how council wants to do this. I think there may be value in just having open discussion around the impact, you know, just generally, um, the impact of each of those assets on the idea that's being proposed. Um, so if that's the way council would like to proceed, uh, we can, you know, determine that at that time. After we've had um, assessment and discussion, then we could look at, you know, overall, what would, what would be the next steps in this um, proposal? And then finally would be just some comments, some feedback on the lens itself. Are there, how, where did it work well? Um, does it need updating? You know, where, um, where could it be improved, I guess? And, um, and that's really what, what is meant to happen with the lens. This data was collected and presented four, four years ago, I believe. Um, so uh, yeah, there, lots changed in that time. So. Um, you know, that's part of uh, the use of the lens is to bring it up to date. So I'm going to just uh, go over the, the how to use it. So that's right in the document that was that's attached to the agenda. And uh, if you go to page, page 10, There's, there's different tools here. It depends on what, what you're comfortable with. It might be different for different situations. Um, <clears throat> this is the, the short form dashboard. The tool in general is meant to help make sound strategic decisions based on assets that were identified by the citizens of Gray Highlands. And so for the Kathy, dashboard- can I just, Kathy, can I just interject here for a minute? Uh, page 10 is like the Ferris wheel. Oh, sorry, that's, that's not what I have on mine. Um, okay. The page before that shows the actual dashboard, which has the red column, the white column, and the green column. 
So would you like to see a staff put that on the screen and speak um, to it or? Yeah, that would probably be easier, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry to interject, I just wanted to make no, sure. No, no, thank you. <clears throat> so, uh, I don't know, yeah, there we go. Right. So, yeah, this is this is the dashboard, the short form dashboard. So along the, the left column are all the assets that were identified, the categories that were identified by the community. Um, the next column shows examples of that, where these, um, you know, breaking down the asset into the smaller um, types. And then on the, then there's the red column, which would be showing where there might be um, a negative impact to a proposal, not applicable, or if it's a positive aspect. And then it lists, you know, all those 11 um, categories. So if you were using this tool, you would just uh, consider and then put a check mark in one of those columns and um, maybe make some notes about if it's a negative impact, what that might be. If it's not applicable, you might want to go to the long form. Um, I forget what page that's on. Page, it's the appendix on page, yeah, page 14. There was a lot of information that the uh, team Guelph couldn't actually get onto the visual. And um, so if you wanted to, I actually uh, tried this out and it was quite helpful. You cannot actually go into this and see, you know, if you can't, if it looks like it's not applicable, then, then this may provide a little bit more guidance. Okay, so if we go back to um, page 10, which is the, um, Oh, yeah, sir, I think my pages are mixed up. It's the, it's the lens itself. And so this is similar to the dashboard, except all the different asset categories are around the, around the outside circle of the lens. The descriptions are there on the left-hand side. So you would look at, in this case, we're considering a dark sky policy for Grey Highlands. So for example, you would maybe starting at the top with agriculture how would a dark sky policy impact agriculture? And then you consider the different topics that are under, under that um, heading and go around the circle and um, you would actually physically make a mark. So if you thought there would be a positive impact for agriculture, you'd put a, a little mark right there. With business and industry, maybe, maybe it might be slightly negative. And for community, I mean, you can go in between two really. And for community, it's maybe not applicable and you, then you might wanna check the longer form, but basically you fill it in that way. And um, eventually you would have the whole circle filled in. And it sort of gives you an immediate idea. If there's a lot that's sort of focused around the center of the lens, then it's basically, um, uh, Moving over to the negative, um, an overall negative impact. Um, if if it's more spread out to the outside, then it's more of a positive impact. So, um, just how to use the lens itself is the next page after the uh, after the lens. So I talked about that. There's a short form and a long form, and and um, you can check in on the long form if ever you think you need more information, you just don't have enough information. Or, you know, if you have a comment that falls outside of any of those categories, but you think is applicable, then certainly include it. Um, it's a communication vehicle. It's useful for planning and decision-making. Um, just going through the highlights here. It's not meant to quantify things and actually help you know, make the decision for you. It's mainly to stimulate conversation and um, involve community groups as well. The more perspectives you have, the better. So I would suggest as we're going through that this exercise, it was supposed to be for council, but we have a lot of staff present, senior staff present. And if, if they want to weigh in on anything, then I think that's certainly valuable. Um, reasons for doing things or not doing things. One of the things that um, if you go to the long form, it, it starts to make some connections between the different asset groups. And if there's a, if you go down just a bit, Raylene. 
Uh, so on, on business and industry there, you see towards the bottom, the third one up, tourism with links to emerging. So business is tying in with tourism, um, tying into employment. The one up above that important link with agriculture and business opportunities. So you start to appreciate, you know, that these are not always isolated categories. They do connect with each other. Um, and I think that's really all I want to say. Are there any questions on how you would actually, you know, put this into practice? Any questions we'll want... from Sorry? I just said, is there any questions from council? Mm. Sorry. Okay. Um, so we'll, we'll probably figure this out as we go along. So was, was everybody able, did everybody get the backgrounder? On the on the dark skies. Um, so that was an email that was sent out by Raylene on the thirty first of May. I think that was yeah. Monday. I think. Okay, so I see. I think right. Councillor Cat maybe didn't see it. Did everyone else see it? So I'll just quickly say the dark sky movement. So the proposal is that the municipality of Grey Highlands adopt a dark sky policy. That's the proposal. And the dark sky movement is a campaign to reduce light pollution. Um, there is dark sky lighting that reduces or mitigates the impact of, of artificial lighting. Um, we're talking outdoors at night. And um, a lot of the lighting is actually certified by the dark sky association. Um, it's uh, designed to be effective, but not um, contribute to light pollution. Um, there is actually an organization called International Dark Sky Places, and a lot of places identify as dark sky places, and um, mainly par parks and places like that that are already, you know, already have some element of, of uh, or low uh, light pollution anyway, but it's a way of preserving those, those places where it's possible to see the night sky. There are a number of physical and environmental benefits associated with reduce, reducing artificial lighting at night. And then there's a range of municipal options. So one is what we're doing right now, which is nothing. Um, one would be to um, have some education and awareness around why dark sky um, is important. And the next step would be to implement and enforce some kind of lighting regulation. Um, and I think, Anyway, yeah, implement and enforce. These are all from various um, sources. So this is actually from a business magazine, Forbes magazine, talking about dark skies in, in, um, in cities and towns. And the last option or the last one identified there would be to actually become um, an international dark sky, uh, recognized dark sky community. So there's a whole range of, um, you know, options there. So when I say, when the proposal says adopt a dark sky policy, um, it, it would just mean that, that uh, council uh, adopts something that would say what, what council's position or what the municipal position is on dark skies and if we're doing anything about it. We, you know, so are there are any questions on the, um, on, the, on the proposal itself? Okay, so the next thing would be to, you know, go through the actual exercise there's two, two options here. I think if we were just doing this on a regular basis, you might do this at home on your own in preparation for a meeting um, and then have discussion at the, the council table. My suggestion might be that instead of us all sitting around, you know, with our heads down trying to do this independently, that we just go through it together and, and share our thoughts as we go through. Does that make sense? Okay. So, um, I guess it would be up to you. Um, do you want Raylene to um, share one of the, the approaches? Like, would you favor the dashboard or the lens itself? Do you want- I think the, dash, the dashboard would I, go ahead, Councillor Nielsen and, and then Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and to Councillor Cons uh, Little. I would definitely say the short form dashboard would be my instinct as to use that. Um, the the different scenario where the the actual lens itself the webbing would be um, helpful if in cases where you know it's a partially negative or partially as you said you know the sliding mm -hmm. scale there whereas mm -hmm. your short form has kind of the check mark 
but I think for the way you myself would work. I think the dashboard is an effective, efficient way of doing the practice, mm -hmm. if that's okay with mm -hmm. you. Sure. What about... Uh... Deputy Mayor had one. Yeah. yeah. I, was, I was going to suggest a visual tool. Um, I feel it's simpler to use. There's, you know, um, you can look at the, um, um, at the asset itself and mm -hmm. determine whether mm -hmm. it's uh, positive, negative, or neutral, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so to me, it would give you a visual representation of what the short form dashboard, you'd have to sort of tally all of those up in the end. Mm -hmm. Whereas over here, you can just have a, um, a quick visual representation. So in terms of efficiency and, and speed, I think the visual tool would be um, better. Um, mm -hmm. But again, again, it depends on how, how, you, how, how deep you want to delve into the issue. Um, I, yeah, so I, w I would have preferred the visual tool because I like uh, visual data, so. Well, you know, there's nothing preventing you from using the, the lens and we can, if it's okay with, with everyone, then we'll, we'll, Raylene can put up the, uh, the dashboard, the short form dashboard. Does that, that work for people? Um, so yeah, Raylene, if you could put the dashboard up and then we'll just go through it. So the, the proposal is, um, that the municipality of Grey Highlands adopt a dark sky policy. How would a dark sky policy impact? And then we'll we'll just go through. Um, and maybe Mr. Mayor, well, I'll just participate in this. Maybe Mr. Mayor, you want to, do you want to? Um, you can carry on. Okay, you, you so. If you have a comment, I would suggest maybe just uh, speaking up, I can't really see anybody. So um, how would a dark sky policy impact business and industry? So small and medium sized businesses, stores, restaurants, markets, large scale industry, employment. Any thoughts around that? I mean, I'll maybe go first. Um, I, I think lighting is very important for security. Lighting is very important for safety uh, and, and, a, uh, and a number of uh, points around that. By saying that though, your night sky lighting shows the ground, but it doesn't reflect up, right? It, it, it sort of, it, so um, probably uh, long as it, it, long as it didn't affect the business negatively in the sense of safety and, you know, with regards to all that, I would say that would be a positive thing, uh, but mm -hmm. just a thought. Oh, Raylene, maybe you could just put a little check mark in for uh, comments back. Okay. Anyone else? Hi, it's uh, Councilor Allwood. I had my hand raised. I'm not sure if you can see it. No, I can't see it. Okay. I, uh, I think it would be a negative impact for uh, small and medium-sized businesses. It, it may affect, uh, you know, they may have to spend money to change their... Uh, their uh, store lighting, their outside store lighting. And uh, it's another regulatory uh, issue that uh, distracts them from their um, business activities. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Just speak up. I, I'd like to jump into uh, Councillor Little. I was gonna say something similar to Councillor Allwood. I was thinking, um, not so much for a small and medium business. I actually uh, see less of a impact there, but large scale businesses working um, 24 hour shifts, having long shifts and, and um, the safety concerns. So, but I, I get, I don't see it as much in the small and medium sized business. Thank you. Anyone so else? If I can seek clarity on that. Um... From Councillor Valiquet, when you say when you refer to safety concerns, you're referring to people who are walking to the night shifts or or commuting back and forth. Is is that what you're referring to? Yeah, I'm of, a, of a shift getting off um, an industry, um, some someone either coming in or or leaving leaving from their shift. Um, so I guess what I'm thinking about specifically is that there may, um, 
there may be costs associated to those businesses for implementing timers, let's say, um, uh, was what I was thinking specifically. Right. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Comment on that myself, if I may. Yeah, go ahead. So I kind of side with um, Councillor Bellicat on this one. One of the other thing when it comes to large scale, so a night sky in the middle of summer starts at 10, 30, 11 o'clock, but a night sky in February starts off around 5, 30, 6 o'clock. And so you could still have delivery trucks showing up. You could have shipments coming in and out of a larger scale industry that has a longer working shift. You would think that trying to implement a dark sky option to perhaps say something like Chapman's where there's trucking uh, happening on a regular basis, you're wanting to make sure those trucks can see all around them. You want to make sure that there's no concerns that way. You want to make sure there's no uh, accidents happening. So that's where I kind of side with um, Councillor Valiquet. Small and medium-sized businesses, you know, my shop, having a dark sky policy, having my lights aimed down so that it's just showing on the front, my front door during Ivers operation, not a problem. It's not going to affect me in any way, no positive nor negative. But for that large scale industry where you're wanting to make sure you can see what's going on around you and you have that uh, that lighting happening, I think would be the, the negative aspect there. Thanks. Um, has everyone had a chance to speak? Who wants if, to speak? If I, if I could just, uh, I thought we were just talking about small and medium sized businesses at this point, but my, my issue with the small and medium sized businesses are that, you know, they don't have the financial resources and the human resources to deal with some of these things that they're focused on their businesses. I know Councilor Nielsen is a small business owner, but if you if Council Nielsen had a an illuminated sign over his business outside that was, uh, you know, like a neon sign or something uh, and was and had to change that to accommodate a dark sky policy, it could be for a small business financially significant. And uh, whereas large scale industry has uh, the resources, both in the uh, staff and maybe capital, financial capital to, to deal with it. And on the safety issue, I think dark sky lighting does illuminate down. So, you know, the issues were regarding safety and, um, you know, I, I don't see that as much of an issue as, as, as the, uh, you know, I believe that dark sky lighting would provide adequate safe lighting uh, pointing down is the way I understand it. But uh, thank you for that. Thank you. Just point of clarity, um, Kathy. I guess where I was coming from was dark sky lighting. It's still lighting. It's just not the. It's not a light pollution heading up. Yeah. And in my mind, you know, this is sort of we would be, uh, we would be talking about this if it was going forward with a new business or a new like a, like a like like something that's like um, for not retrofitting current businesses, but. If, if there was a new business that was being considered or or zoning, this would be something that would be added, could be added to that as a as as part of a, a condition or a part of it. But I, I it'd be something that would be retrofitted to current businesses. At least that's how I'm taking this as we go through the this matrix. Is it's we're talking about proposals in front of council. So if a new restaurant or a new business was coming. And I, and I realize, and I, and I guess I can relate this to the Niagara Escarpment Commission, where we have a night sky policy, where it would be as a, as an, a condition for new development, right? Mm -hmm. So, so it, it, you know, in a sense of of current businesses, I wouldn't say that's that's not where I'm thinking. I'm thinking about a proposal that's in front of council, and this is going forward, not going to current businesses, and and certainly I would think, and I don't have enough knowledge that night sky lighting still have to provide a certain lighting. To me, it's not polluting. You're not losing light to the sky above, but it's still showing light, you know, and, and there's, mm -hmm. I, I presume there's probably a lot of designs that do could still look after the safety part or the, you know, the part of illuminating and, and probably in a sense of a sign, I would think maybe there would, instead of illuminating the, the sign, the lights may be above it illuminating focusing on the sign, not illuminating the sign. So that the light is shining on the sign, but not shining up. And that's, mm -hmm. maybe that's, maybe we're interpreting night sky lighting differently. To me, it's just a different technology that's available that just doesn't illuminate up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, 
Yes, there is a lot of um, specific lights, you know, lights, uh, light, dark sky lighting that's certified um, because it does exactly what you say. It provides a level of uh, security and safety. In fact, uh, what I was reading was that if it is focused on, a, on an area, focusing down on the area where people are and vehicles are, there is less glare and less actual interference from the light shining up and, and creating glare above. So I think this discussion is interesting because, um, you know, the whole idea that uh, the mayor is suggesting of applying it to new builds is, is uh, would not negatively impact existing owners. And if, if it were to be included, suppose, I don't know what the cost might be, but it could always be included in the, you know, or in our um, community improvement grants, even that you want to upgrade your lighting and make it, you know, comply or be conforming to uh, dark sky, conforming to dark sky lighting, then there might be incentives rather than, um, you know, uh, rather than it be punitive. So just, we just get into a little bit of nuance um, when we start, you know, comparing our, our perspectives. If, if um, maybe we should continue moving on, does anybody want to jump to a certain category? We don't have to go through this in order. Point of order. Yeah. What, one of the things, uh, one of the outcomes is becoming an IDA recognized dark sky community. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that would involve existing businesses changing their light lighting to conform to uh, um, a dark sky policy. Um, maybe, maybe somebody could clarify that for me, but uh, I don't see how one could be an IDA recognized dark sky community and still have lighting that didn't conform. So it could possibly affect ex existing buildings is, is my point. If that were an option that council decided in this practice session to, uh, to move. I thank think, you. yeah, thank, thanks for that. I, I think um, the policy is open-ended. The policy could be you know, at one end of the spectrum, it's just um, educating and making people aware. Um, there's no, there's no, um, uh, people don't, don't have to comply unless they want to. Um, so it's, it's kind of a range of, of possibilities and maybe it's a phased approach too that, you know, if you really, if people really like the idea, you might end up at having uh, being identified as a dark sky community, but um, it's more at just right now, we have nothing as far as I know. And um, so it's just, you know, uh, introducing something that recognizes this, uh, this concept. I guess for the, for the benefit of my point of order was the, you know, I was, I was looking at those last three in, in item four of your handout. Yeah. That those would be like the recommendations council can implement uh, the dark sky education and awareness. It can in implement an enforcing quality outdoor lighting ordinance or become a recognized. So, you know, I, I couldn't support um, personally those last two, but I would certainly support the first item if, yeah. and as we go through this procedure, mm -hmm. I would tick the boxes that would lead me to that decision. Yes. Um, yeah. So, okay. That was that was the point I was trying to make, and I, yeah. if we're not operating that way, then then I'm misinformed. Sorry. No, it just it's sort of we you know um, I guess the idea of a dark sky policy I, I didn't want it to seem too onerous, you know, that we were going to start regulating people and telling them what they had to do. It, it's more of a there's a whole range of things here, and when you're starting at nothing, then it's I think it has to be a gradual process. Right. I'm not sure if the Ontario Building Code actually has something in it that says, uh, you know, community lighting now has to be uh, dark sky compliant. I seem to have read that somewhere, but I'm not sure if that's true. Maybe our building, maybe Debbie could uh, answer that question. Is Debbie here? Marty? Marty? Somebody, is there a staff person who would like to speak to that? Or? Um, Director Benner, Kathy can't see, or Councillor Little can't see you, so you're going to have to speak up. Certainly. Uh, sorry about that. I was just looking for my unmute button. Um, Debbie's not with us, um, but um, there's 
In terms of implementing a dark sky policy, there's a couple different ways of doing it. We can certainly look at uh, what provisions are in the Ontario Building Code. I'm, I'm actually not personally familiar with that provision, what would that would cover that. But we're also working on um, community design guidelines. Um, so we can we can throw that in, in something like that. We can also look at even including something like that in our general provisions in our zoning bylaw. Section five covers mm. those sort of things. So there's there's several ways of implementing a, a dark sky policy within the planning and building approvals framework. Well, thank you, Director Benner. That's that's um, yeah, that's interesting. As we're moving into our comprehensive zoning bylaw process, um, something to keep in mind. Councillor Little, I may just jump in there as well. Okay. It's uh, thank you, uh, and and much similar to uh, uh, Director Benner had mentioned, uh, this can also be implemented. Actually, excuse me, it is already implemented within our development standards for dark sky compliant street lights. Uh, within our uh, municipal road allowance. Uh, I do, uh, um, this dark sky compliant, typically just, it's compliant as long as the light is reflecting down and, yeah. and not up, but you right. do have that reflective lighting that kind of illuminates the, the rest of the roadway. So yeah. there is some uh, things that, um, uh, as far as the engineering standards that we currently have that the design is actually taking in consideration. Um, interpret, interpreting this, uh, the new LED lights, they really show quite a glow uh, rather than the, um, the lithium ones we've had before. Uh -huh. But you are getting a different of technology coming into the, the dark sky compliance as well. So Right. Yeah, thank you for that. That's, that's really interesting. I, I think when you say we're already doing it, and then I think too, you know, um, when we're approving, you know, small scale commercial and, and we, we request or part of the site plan is that the lights be directed, you know, downward. So in a sense, we're, we're doing a little bit of that already, but um, yeah, thank you for that. So just to add a little bit more, uh, the municipality replaced all their street lights uh, through the, um, uh, the efficiency grant, I believe four years ago. Mm -hmm. and the, all the new LED lights that were installed are dark sky compliant as well. So. Oh, excellent. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you to staff for that input. Um, so is there any, uh, you know, there's no way we're going to get through all of this this morning. Um, but is there any section, any asset category that someone would like to uh, jump to? Is there any, anything on here that you consider to be a positive? I'll, we all want to talk now. It's hard. This, this is a little more difficult because we all want to talk. May I go first, Mr. Mayor? Go ahead. I was going to say um, I would classify it as a positive for the people aspect of the lens, given that um, the night sky helps people sleep. It helps have less impact through windows and lighting. Um, there's a bit more natural um, schedule for for. Um, your the light sources and stuff like that so people kind of go through their day a, a bit more natural path so I would say that it's a positive for people that's my input I got director lemon laughing I like that <laughs> thank you well from an municipality as, as uh, director Le uh, lemon said is that our, our, our street lighting is dark sky so I guess that's probably a positive thing. I know I will uh, uh, agree that LED lighting has changed the, the lighting. So if we've gone to night sky lighting, but we've improved the lighting, that's sort of a win-win because you remember the orange yellowy lights sort of gave a glow, but the new, the new LED is more crisp and much more, I find it's much more safer. You can really yeah. see clearly. And, and if you ever try out travel across rural Ontario going somewhere, it's interesting when you go into a community that hasn't gone to the LED lighting versus the ones that have. Yeah. My other question to you, Kathy, is what about, uh, is there any um, around birds? Because, you know, we hear a lot with regards to birds and lighting and, you know, birds go to a light. Is night sky lighting a, a positive thing in the sense of uh, the environment, in the sense of, of birds or bats or whatever? Um, I don't know. I'm okay. asking that question. 
All right, well, let's go down to the natural environment asset and uh, focus on that for a minute. So um, I know when you've got a lot of office buildings that are lit up all night long, it, it really is uh, really harmful to, uh, to, to, to birds. And, um, you know, in big cities, they're trying to mitigate that. But um, let's, uh, if we're thinking about Grey Highlands, um, somebody knows anything about the um, effect on, on birds at night or any other aspect of the natural environment that you think a dark sky policy would have a negative or a positive impact on? Anybody want to chip in? Like I said earlier on, Kathy, that um, part of the policy with the NEC, and the NEC is very um, much a, a natural corridor to a right. certain degree, they have implemented uh, dark sky lighting is, uh, they don't really, they, they, there's some flexibility, but that's certainly where they would like to people to go in a sense of, of, of that type of lighting. So for mm -hmm. example, you know, a new build, and this is replying, this is responding to new builds or new developments. So basically, for example, you may have a driveway with lighting while well, the lighting, you know, they would require, you know, lighting to be down, certainly around the buildings, focus down, mm -hmm. um, you know, not your regular. So then, because because with an agriscarbon and, and, and with the development, it's, it's sort of trying to keep that impact from the viewscape to a sort of a minimum as well, right? So that's part of right. that environment, which Grey Highlands uh, has a great deal of area that is in the NEC as well, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, having that policy that that sort of reflects that part of that natural corridor is, mm -hmm. is part of the sort of the direction and from the NEC. Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, it, it says right here under natural environment, we've got, you know, the, obviously the Niagara Escarpment in our municipality, the Beaver Valley. Um, there are maps available online that show you light pollution and you can zero in right into, uh, you know, our, our um, Gray and Bruce counties. Northern Bruce Peninsula actually has a dark sky. Um, it's a dark sky reserve or uh, preserve, I guess it's called. Um, so looking, you know, just looking at that light pollution map, you can see that the Beaver Valley area and especially over to the east to little towards little Germany and Kalapur, you know, that's a significant area that doesn't have a lot of artificial light anyway. So, you know, maybe, maybe there is some, um, something to protect, you know, moving forward. That's something that if we're aware of it, then we can um, initiate a policy around artificial outdoor lighting um, that would help preserve the dark sky that we already do have here and we're fortunate in this municipality so um, you know that is I think that is a definite uh, connection to uh, this policy and to the natural environment. I know we, yeah go ahead sorry. Something I, I purchased last fall was um, a, a solar light that I have in my yard. And it, it's funny, it has two settings. It has a dim, and then if something triggers it, it goes brighter. So if for safety, if something, there's, there's a, a dimmer light, and then if you go near it, whether it's for security or walking or, or wanting more light, it goes brighter. Yeah. So it has a, a built-in, dimmer switch, I guess you want to call it, which I thought was mm -hmm. interesting. And maybe that's new technology as well. And just as a side, FCM had one session yesterday that with our street lighting, uh, there's a lot of a lot of capabilities of smart technology that can be incorporated into LED lighting and new lighting. And and maybe there's something even dimming and, and different things that, right. you know, there's a lot of technology coming that's changing a lot of the dynamics. And with LED lighting, with the energy savings that are there, there's a lot of dynamics that really you know it just keeps changing in that sense as well yeah. so it's evolving yeah. good points um yeah it is it, it can be cost saving because you're you're not lighting areas that don't need to be lit um you're uh you know as far as natural environment it emits less energy so you're um you know it's it's good for uh for climate action there's research, research showing that it, it's a positive impact on wildlife um, when they have, you know, dark areas to be in, you know, and even human beings are, are natural 
you know, waking and sleeping hours are affected by artificial light. So there's a, not, a lot of impacts on, on the natural environment if we consider wildlife and ourselves to be part of that natural environment. Kathy, um, I yes, I Daniel. Thank you. I also think that there's a component um, that I don't understand very well, but livestock, I know um, according to the pig code, and there's lots of people on this table that'll know from a different livestock perspective, that within like large industrial barns, you can't have the lights on 24 hours a day. And then we think about that, of course. Um, so of course in uh, Great Highlands and in Gray, most of our farms are, you know, most of our animals are outside. And, and though right now, I think you're right, right now we um, are privileged here to have dark skies and see the stars. But I think that there's an argument for um, protecting it for livestock as well. Mm -hmm. So Danielle, with that, in terms of agriculture, then would, do you have an opinion on whether it would be a positive or a, a negative impact to have some kind of policy in place? Well, I think certainly from an animal um, perspective, I would argue that there definitely um, uh, that it is a positive. I would think that you would have to um, think through the component and the logistics of all the movements that happen in particular at larger, um, larger barns, you know, in the wee hours of the morning, right. et cetera. But I think certainly from a, um, uh, from a livestock perspective, it's a positive. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So we're on agriculture right now. Anyone else have any comments about the po po possible the potential impact of a dark sky policy on agriculture. I think uh, just just in a sense of agriculture, lighting, barn lighting sometimes is for security reasons as well. But providing long as it's shining down, I don't see that would be a negative mm -hmm. thing. I, mm -hmm. You know, as long as it's shining down and I mean, there's another aspect of lighting is also motion detecting that you don't have light on at all until there's a, an indication of a, a predator or something that's around or, or right. security reasons that it then comes on. So, you know, 95% of the time there is no lighting. And when it does come on, if it was night sky driven down with a, then it's, it's very limited. And so I guess that's not a negative thing. So if it's not yeah. negative, I think it's positive. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was wondering when I was thinking about this myself, I, I thought agriculture might have the biggest, uh, there might be a quite a significant impact on, on the um, ability of farmers to just carry on with their normal, we call it normal farming activities. But um, yeah, it, it can be mitigated, like you say, downward, you know, facing down and motion, motion detection. Anyone else have any comments on agriculture? If, if I could just say something, uh, you know, I've changed all my outside lighting on my farm to uh, LED lighting quite a while ago. I used to have motion sensing lights, but uh, given the issue with cluster flies and other uh, little insects that get into your uh, lighting fixtures that are usually 20 feet above the ground um, and the maintenance requirement of that, it, it becomes an issue. Yeah. Um, when they don't work and uh, I can tell you that when uh, I have to go up to my barn at night uh, and it's dark I have to wear a, a headlight because I can't see the the ground in front of my feet uh, you know yeah. I happen to live in a in, in my farm my barns are down some shady lanes and uh, it's, it's yeah. dark as Hades at night so <laughs> there's a safety issue and uh, mm -hmm. a safety issue with maintaining some of that technology at uh, people of my age anyways I don't yeah. want to be climbing up 20 feet. You have to start calling yeah. electricians. But, uh, you know, it's the, the, the benefit to agriculture and farmers would be the uh, lower cost. I mean, sodium lighting was expensive mm -hmm. and, uh, and and the bulbs were expensive. And again, they, they fail also, but, uh, yeah. you know, LED lighting and uh, but, but on on barnyard lighting, you, you tend to want to be illuminating a larger area. So having a downward lit area, you know, directly in front of your barn door, maybe, or doesn't illuminate your barn yard or the area that Mary McQueen talked about predator issues and 
you just livestock and fencing and what's going on at night. I mean, if you've got livestock outside and you're uh, called to duty uh, when it's dark, you know, you, yeah, there were issues. So that uh, yeah. you know that that would be my point on agriculture. I, I I'm not sure it's really that applicable. Certainly in uh, in the environment and nature, it's it's a huge a huge positive. You know, we were talking about birds, but not only are they attracted to lighted buildings, but it disrupts their migratory uh, right. activity. And, yeah, uh, yeah. thank yeah. you. Thanks. Um, we're getting on close to a uh, quarter, you know, quarter to the hour. And um, Kathy, you sorry one... to interrupt for one quick yeah. second. I know you can't see, but I can see that Director Moyer want, would like to speak. Thank you. All right, I was just going to comment quickly on the agriculture as the mayor did as well, but I know as the agriculture changes and people work different hours and are working out, I know myself, a lot of times I end up finding myself now with kids being out at night, doing a lot of field work and stuff at night, like how would that affect, like if there was a policy, would that limit the hours of work that people can do? I know a lot of like harvesting and stuff is done at nighttime depending on frosts and stuff. So it could potentially affect some of that as well. We just have to keep that in mind mm -hmm. on the agricultural side and, and hours of work uh, does push some of us with different priorities to, to work later at night and uh, other times of the day as well. Right, yeah. You're here. <laughs> yeah, thanks, thanks, Sean. Um, so, yeah. Sorry, Kathy. Yes. Um, I just wanted to point out that I think that um, we're saying the positive, negative, um, my assumptions of what the night sky policy is. I think it, that if we implemented a night sky policy, that would have a positive impact on Grey Highlands lifestyle because we're known for the ruralness, being able to see the night sky, uh, the stars, the whatever. So I think I would put an X under um, positive for Grey Highlands lifestyle under the tourism one. Under tourism. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Raleigh. There was something in there about the peace and quiet of, uh, was that culture or community? Somewhere I saw something about what we're known for, what people identified as the nice peace and quiet. Yeah, lifestyle. Right, there it is. Yeah, great, thank you. I, I think we could probably talk longer. And, and, you know, if we were going to do this, we would be doing this kind of on our own bringing our ideas back to council, not, not sort of going through everything. And uh, I really appreciated the conversation. Is there anything anyone else wants to say before we actually get off the lens itself and uh, maybe talk about um, just the exercise and where we go from here? Any final comments on the dark sky proposal? I had a final comment, but it was more about the exercise itself. Oh. I was just going to say, yeah. it's, you know, you're listening to the conversation. It's kind of showing how everybody has different views and it's our own experiences, be it uh, business or farming or lifestyle that each of us have that impact how we use the lens and how we view each item in the lens. Right. So mm -hmm. I think that this exercise has kind of shown that, yes, when we all use it at home for ourselves, it'll show how my, my own um, biases and perspectives and, and, um, experiences will guide me in a certain direction, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's exactly we're all going to end up at the same spot, right? Right. right. It's kind of fun to see that. Hey. Mr. Mayor, I'll, I'll turn the, this over to you. <laughs> all right. So I'm going to go with Deputy Mayor and then Councilor Elway. Thank you. Thank Pat. you, Mayor McLean. Um, the, the one um, question I, I guess I had, and since we're learning on how to use this tool, would be. Um, where do we talk about the corporate considerations of the municipality? Uh, for example, one of the things that could come out of the uh, uh, out of the discussion would be the liability issue, which comes out on on many different discussions. Every time we're looking at a new project, we talk about the liability side of it. So, should there be another arm to that Ferris wheel or another um, row to the uh, to the dashboard that talks uh, talks a little bit about the corporate uh, perspective uh, and the corporate considerations. Um, I, th that would be my question. And mm -hmm. I'm just looking to get some discussion on that uh, since we, we are learning how to use the tool. Thank you. Okay. I, I, I would suggest 
Oh, if I may, Your Worship. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, was that, might, yeah. that might fall under municipal government, um, municipal capacity to help facilitate processes. Um, so that the, you know, the capacity of the municipality, it also might fall under financial. Um, but I think it does fit under municipal government. If not, we could make it. And just a comment with regards to the corporation. I mean, just thinking about this whole scenario, it could be that we have, uh, or, you know, as a municipality, we're dark sky friendly. It's not by law, it's not implementing. It's just we're, we're dark sky friendly, and that's sort of a sort of a, a not a policy, but a, but a sort of a position that we sort of could take as a municipality. And as, as we move through with development, we suggest that, and the, and we educate as you mentioned that one slide of the first point. I think Councillor Alwood talked about is it's more education and the benefits of and and all that kind of stuff. So it's not making it like you know. Uh, mandatory but it's dark sky friendly type of thing and, and then you sort of get the buy-in that way as well right so it's just a thought it's just an idea on the corporate side yeah. it's it's that statement you know people could use hey we're dark sky friendly you know it's just a, a corporate you know positioning more than being told that they have to do that right so right. yeah i see tom has his hand up yeah go ahead tom thank you i was just going to wrap up the dark skies discussion and, and mention that uh you know i know gray highlands is uh, has issues with windmills, but the dark sky issue and, and windmills and the lighting on those windmills, those red lights flashing at night have been a real issue for our uh, ratepayers uh, as part of that uh, multiple municipal wind turbine working group. I can tell you that I've had people send me videos of those red lights flashing in their, uh, in their bedroom windows, even mm -hmm. with, you know, uh, trying to black out curtains and things like that. It's still an issue. And, uh, uh, so, you know, there, you know, the education component of a dark sky policy and how it affects some, you know, it's one of the health issues that's associated with uh, problems with wind turbines. But thank you for that. Yeah. That's a good example of a corporation, right, of, of a certain type or a certain height and stuff. And, and communication towers have to have lights as well for safety reasons and for aviation and, and, and planes and that. Kathy? Yeah, so just um, on the lens itself, this exercise this morning, um, Deputy Mayor pointed out perhaps a lack of clarity maybe around the municipal, the actual municipal governance role. Any other comments, either positive or negative about the experience? Tom? Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I, you know, if I can see this would be an aid to individual counselors, perhaps in uh, formulating opinions. I, I wondered if we were trying to en encourage staff to, to get involved. You know, I, I think I mentioned this earlier when the, uh, we had a discussion in a council meeting about the lens that uh, when we get a staff report, we see how it ties into our strategic plan and uh, the impacts on staffing and finance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How does, you know, if this were to become something similar, how would, how would it affect staff's reports? And mm -hmm. uh, that kind of feedback to council as we receive uh, staff reports for information. So um, we need to consider that, I believe in our discussion. It's a, a useful tool um, to get people thinking, but uh, I know Councilor Allen is not with us, but he thought there was a certain group think to it, but uh, I think individually, uh, it, it could be, uh, it is rather a useful tool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you, Councillor Nielsen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just um, my own thought on the, the staff aspect. I view the lens as a decision-making tool and staff aren't the ones making the decision. I don't know if having staff's lens perspective put onto a staff report would be necessary because of that. Like that's my viewpoint on it, right? Um, staff do show staff reports that show their link to our strategic plan, their link to um, what direction council has given in the past because the strategic plan is something that the council has passed and such. But I don't think staff would be needed to go through the lens and do the lens exercise themselves 
on a staff report because that's the decision-making part and that's our part. We use the lens to help us decide, is this good or bad um, as, a, as an overall and should we vote yay or nay for an item because we're the ones that as a body make the decision. That's just my thought on, on the staff perspective. Good point, Kathy. Yeah, just gonna say in response to Dane, um, yeah, all the information for this came from the community, right? We represent the community. And, um, and, and uh, so it, and it had community support. And part of the, the process of the lens is to keep it in the community and continue to get that input and support and update from comments. Um, and certainly, you know, staff, uh, I'm really happy to hear staff opinions this morning. Like, I, I don't think we wanna be so restrictive, but I agree with you that, um, you know, a council decision-making tool but you know, we think of th we think about things too from the strategic plan perspective. So I think there's some integration there, but maybe you know we stay in our own lane a little bit. I, I Mr. Mayor, I would it, would like to know if there's any comments from from other staff members who are here. Yeah, certainly. I'll, uh, uh, Madam uh, CAO or staff, are there other other thoughts? In the sense, this is this again. This is just an exercise that we're going through. And uh, is there any other comments from staff? I can't believe Michelle doesn't have a comment. <laughs> that's that's a positive thing. <laughs> well, I guess uh, they're all they're all. Oh, there we go. I I, I wet the whistle there. Go ahead, Michelle. I just was going to say I enjoyed the conversation and uh, I can bite my tongue periodically. Um, Councillor Little and I do. Um, this is kind of an overriding philosophy of the work we do. And I think it, I know it's an overused term, but it's around looking at a holistic approach to things. Um, I do agree with Councillor Nielsen's um, perspective that I think it's ultimately Council's decision. So I think um, we... I think we provide input on, on this and council ultimately makes the decision, so. Thank you for that, uh, Michelle. Any other comments uh, from staff? <clears throat> I think it's been a th very much a, of a thought provoking. I think that's part of what it, it, it makes you think. And I think that's a good thing, right? I don't know if any other would agree with that. Councilor Allwood, your hand's still up. Do you wish to speak? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we we have no idea what you said. I was <laughs> muted there, sir. I had that up from uh, previously yeah. when we were sharing the screen, and you couldn't see people. But uh, thank yeah. you, Your Worship. I not a problem. So, um, Kathy, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to thank uh, staff and colleagues for you know uh, doing this, squeezing this in in a busy. It's been a busy. It's a busy day, busy weeks, and um, I, but I've enjoyed it. I think um, going forward, maybe individually, we can try just practicing the lens on our own and certain, you know, it's some situations it's not necessary, uh, you know, agenda items, it's not really necessary, but others, it, it helps, I think, a little bit to, uh, to, to go through the process. So, um, and, then, and then certainly if we're having discussion at council, um, allude to the lens if that's you know helped you in your in your thought process so that's uh i just yeah thank you everyone okay well it's it's creeping up to uh 12 o'clock here we do have a one o'clock meeting i do want to just repeat that um uh, this was a, a depiction uh of, of, a, of a scenario that we were using this morning from the viewing public so uh, again, this was just an exercise to, is using the lens as, a, as an example of, or sorry, of the night sky, sky uh, lighting as an example of going through the lens. Uh, one other comment, I will say that just because we use the night sky lighting as an example, uh, the 2003 blackout that happened uh, when the grid completely went off, you know, that there were people in Toronto that had never seen night sky before mm -hmm. and were experienced to that, uh, which in a sense was uh, hard to believe when we live out here in, in Great Grey Highlands, but uh, there are those scenarios that uh, are, are, are there. So 
Uh, seeing there's no other discussion and uh, it's 11.59, can I have a motion then to adjourn? Moved by Deputy Mayor, second by Councilor Bellicat, that we adjourn and uh, that's uh, all in favor of that. So that's uh, carried. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll call that to uh, 11.59 and we'll see you all at uh, one o'clock or there thereabouts is when we start. So a little bit sooner than that. So quickly go grab a bite to eat and we'll see you at uh, before one. Okay, take care everyone. Thanks. Thanks for the viewing public and staff. Bye for now.